Welcome to Advances in Allergy and Asthma, a webinar series presented by Allergy and Asthma Network in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. Our webinar series helps Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. We are joined today by Dr. Kelly Maples, and she's going to take us on a life's journey of allergy care. Born in Pennsylvania, Dr. Kelly Maples grew up in New Jersey and graduated from Rutgers University. After graduating from Temple University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, she moved to Norfolk, Virginia with her fiance for residency in internal medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School, where her now husband, Christopher, served in the US Navy. After residency, she completed an allergy and immunology fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, where she worked on research focusing on eosinophilic esophagitis. She then returned to Norfolk, where she now serves as an associate professor of pediatrics and internal medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School and Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. She also serves on the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Board of Regents and is chair of the ACAAI Dermatology Committee. She lives in Suffolk, Virginia with her husband, three children, and two doodles. Dr. Maples, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Sally. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Asthma and Allergy Network and the College for having me today. Just gonna change my mind. So hello everybody, hello, everybody. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, um, thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to listen today. These are my disclosures. I have no conflicts for today's presentation. The objectives of today's presentation are to prepare patients and families for the transitions that occur from birth to independent living to develop a process to transition patients from pediatric to adult care and to be prepared for the changing needs of older al adult allergy patients. As allergists and allergy care providers, we have both the privilege and challenge of caring for patients throughout their lifespan. But even those of us who only see pediatric or only see adult patients still need to be prepared to help patients navigate through the many transitions they will experience through their lifetimes. Today, I will first discuss transitions children experience as they grow and mature as they relate to food allergy and asthma. Next, I will discuss the transition process guiding patients from pediatric to adult health care. And finally, I will briefly discuss the care of older allergy patients. The first transition families will experience is having someone else like a babysitter, teacher, or daycare provider care for their child. This will occur at different time points for different families, but can be stressful for all parents, especially those of children with special health care needs like food allergy. In addition to the stress of someone else caring for their child, parents know that infants and toddlers can't tell teachers when they are feeling bad, and they can't tell teachers what food they need to avoid. A 2017 study of 289 parents of food allergic children found that over a quarter, 27.4%, felt that school is not safe for their food allergic child. When asked what could help change that view, 94% when it's stock epinephrine at their school or daycare facility, 81% when it's food labels on food served at the school, 86% when it menus with food allergy information, and 86% also when it's student food allergy education, which is not relevant in preschool, but will become more useful as their child grows. As we know, many more parents believe their child has food allergy than do in reality. And many parents overestimate the danger of food allergy and feel that their allergic child is due to have a severe reaction or worse. Education is the best way to help families with these concerns. We can help families clarify who does and who does not in fact have a true food allergy, thereby reducing unnecessary food avoidance, worry, and purchase of epinephrine. And for those families that do have a food allergic child, we can educate and train them so that they may feel empowered to protect their child. 
We want food allergic want families food allergic to be vigilant, families not, vigilant not, fearful. not fearful. Dr. Dr. Maples, we're getting a lot of reports. Humans, humans, some, we are Dr. bad at um, understanding risk, and we tend to overestimate the odds of unlikely or rare events. When emotion is involved, as in the case of a food allergic child, risk perception is altered further. That being said, helping parents compare the risk of food allergy fatality to other risks they understand to be rare may help them gain some perspective. A United Kingdom population study of 13 million children between 0 and 15 found that the incidence of food allergy fatality to 0.006 fatalities per 100,000 children per year during the period study, which was 1990 to 2000. Food allergy deaths in that population were much less common than other causes of sudden unexpected death like car accidents, which occurred at about at three uh, deaths per 100,000 children per year. According to the National Weather Service, the risk of an American be, being struck by lightning is about 1 in 1.2 million per year, and the risk of fatality from being struck by lightning is about 1 in 10 million per year. The Consumer the Product Consumer Safety Product Commission Safety reported 4.37 bike fatalities per million youth, ages 5 to 20, 5 to 20 per year, and most of those children were not children wearing, a were wearing a helmet. This slide this helps slide visualize, helps some, visualize of some of the data. This is data this in an unselected in population. population, so these are all so people, all not people, just people with food allergy. And in the unselected population, you can see food allergy, represented here by the purple bar, is about as common as death due to lightning, or 1 in 10 million. On this slide, we see the risk of fatality from food allergy in, a, in an allergic population. And here, food allergy, is also, food allergy fatalities are also represented in the purple bar. And they're about as common as death due to fire, about 1 in 100,000. And they are less common than death due to murder or car accident. So you probably don't have time to go through all of this data with all of your food allergic families, but quickly comparing the risk of death due to food allergy to deaths to the fire, lightning, or bike accident may help parents better understand their child's risk. In some cases, I have shown these last two slides to anxious parents and have found it helpful. Although food allergy and anaphylaxis fatalities are rare, parents should be aware of risk, act, risk factors for food allergy fatality. We know that both sexes are equally impacted, and most fatalities occur in the second or third decade and are rare under age 10. This can be reassuring for parents getting ready to send their children to daycare or preschool. Most patients who experience the fatality have had a previous reaction to the cause of the food, Knowing what a food, what food, food the child is allergic to can help us protect them. them. We know that delay in epinephrine or not using epinephrine at all, asthma, risk-taking behavior, and upright posture at the time of reaction are also risk factors for food allergy fatality. And while we can't modify all the factors, we can make a difference. We can be sure that help we can be sure to help parents feel confident on using epinephrine we can teach them how when and why to use epinephrine and let them know that epinephrine is safe so they don't hesitate to use it we can encourage um, parents to be sure they follow their child's asthma action plan to the so that the child's asthma is under good control we can encourage patients to not uh, we can encourage parents to not put patients in the upright posture during allergic reactions. Most food allergy action plans now tell them to have the child lie down and not stand up or sit up. Risk-taking behavior is a tough one, but as, child, as children get older, we can use education to help mitigate that. When it's time to start school or daycare, we want parents to be proactive and to be good communicators. They should notify the school of their child's food allergies and what foods the child needs to avoid. They should provide and review a food allergy management plan. And in order for the parents to be able to review the plan with teachers and staff, we need to be sure they understand it before they leave our office. Parents should bring all medications to school, including two doses of epinephrine, and they should work to develop a plan for their child. 
not just what foods to avoid and what to do in an emergency, but also encouraging non food treats and alternative foods for their child. They should communicate with the school on a regular basis and let teachers know words that their young child may use to describe their allergic reaction, like a hot tongue or burning tongue. At our children's hospital, in addition to our normal food allergy action plan, we offer an additional form that we call Managing Food Allergy And this plan is intended to help prevent reactions and accidental exposures and to be sure emergency medications are on hand. We don't use it for all patients, but we do use it for worried parents or those that feel the school isn't taking proper precautions. And this is just another way to clearly communicate with the school on how to best keep the child safe. The CDC the offers CDC a very offers useful a very guide useful on managing food allergies food at school allergies and early care programs. Program. This is available online and it's useful not only for schools but for parents as well. It does a really good job at explaining what food allergy is in clear language. It explains the treatment of food allergy, the safety of epinephrine, the occasional need for a second dose of epinephrine, and also gives examples of how children often explain, children often explain their food allergic reactions. Peanut-free schools and tables. I'm sure most of you have been asked about peanut-free schools, classrooms, or tables. Dr. Abrams and Dr. Green, uh, Greenhawk published a very useful review and position paper on this earlier this year. We know that about half of peanut allergic families self-report a history of a severe allergic reaction in their child. And some parents worry their child may have a dangerous reaction from environmental peanut exposure, from inhaling aerosolized peanut or by coming into contact with peanut dust or peanut butter on tables. The United States, state governments, and our professional societies do not support a peanut ban, and the Australian Allergy Society specifically recommends against such bans. But some schools in the United States continue to ban peanut in cafeterias, classrooms, and sometimes the entire school. So what's right? The authors reviewed several studies supporting their viewpoint that peanut bans are not necessary. And I'll review some of those. The chance of having fatal anaphylaxis to exposure to environmental peanut is exceptionally low with an unlikely mechanism. We know that environmental peanut exposure through skin contact or inhaling peanut vapors does not trigger systemic reactions. They review studies that have shown that peanut allergen does not aerosolize. There's no peanut protein in peanut vapors. They've also, they also reviewed other studies that showed that skin contact with peanut butter or peanut dust can at worst cause a local skin reaction. Another reason they don't support it is that it's hard or impossible to enforce. It would be very difficult to check every food product that entered a school for the entire school year for peanut content. There is concern that bans may cause anxiety in patients and their families, negatively impacting their quality of life. And these bans may alter risk perception by sending the incorrect message that environmental peanut exposure is dangerous. There's concern that peanut bans may create a false sense of security at schools and result in decreased school preparedness for anaphylaxis treatment, but this has not been proven in the literature. The authors also point out that milk causes more food allergy fatalities in young children than peanut does. The UK population study that I cited earlier, which reported 0.006 food allergy fatalities per 100,000 children per year, found that 50% of those fatalities were from milk, and no one's discussed banning milk. The state of Massachusetts did a five-year retrospective study of different school districts, some that had peanut bans and others that didn't, and they found no difference in epinephrine use between the schools that banned peanut and the schools that did not ban peanut. So for these reasons, the authors recommend against peanut bans and suggest that schools and policymakers focus on evidence-based recommendations, like hand washing after meals, cleaning tables with soap and water between students, and preventing children from sharing snacks. They do recommend that schools consider a peanut-free table or a food allergy-aware table with decreased sharing for children in younger grades. The Massachusetts retrospective study that found no difference in epinephrine use between schools with a peanut ban or no peanut ban did find decreased epinephrine use in schools that offered peanut-free tables. As children move into elementary school, they become better at communicating and can begin to self-advocate. 
but they're more independent and meals are not as closely supervised as they were in preschool. So parents should continue to keep teachers and schools informed of their child's asthma and allergies. We encourage um, parents to discuss with teachers non-food treats and prizes such as stickers and erasers when they wanna give the class a prize instead of giving foods. Um, ask the parents to bring alternative snacks in. So if there's a birthday party and the child is allergic to the food that was brought in, they're not completely left out. Children at this age are getting old enough to um, be taught to advocate for themselves. Teach them to report their food allergy to any time a new adult offers them a food. And you should also start to teach them about their asthma action, their asthma action plan and their food allergy action plan. Parents can educate teachers and we can educate teachers too. It's great to volunteer at local schools to teach teachers and cafeteria staff about food allergies, what epinephrine is and show them the trainers. Uh, there are videos available online to help teach peers about food allergy. Once kids are in elementary school, they're getting old enough to learn a little bit about it. The SOAR program or science and outcome of asthma and food allergy research program out of Northwestern led by Dr. Ruchi Gupta makes uh, great videos that are geared towards specific age groups. And the youngest age group they target is kindergarten to three. In addition to videos explaining food allergy, they also have videos explaining asthma. These are great appropriate short videos. They're produced with food allergic student input and they're designed to increase student awareness of food allergy and its treatment. Um, I encourage you to look at them online. I think they're great. They can even be used in clinic because they're short. As children grow and move on to middle school and high school, they become more independent and knowledgeable, but they also might start to engage in more risky behaviors. Around the start of middle school is when many children will be ready to self-carry epinephrine and albuterol. A well-known study of allergists found that most allergists feel children are ready to self-carry epinephrine around the age of 12 to 14 years. This is certainly not one size fits all. And when determining if a child should self-carry epinephrine or albuterol, consider the child's asthma control, severity of previous reactions, and most importantly, the child's readiness. When it's time to consider self-carrying these devices, epinephrine and albuterol, ask the patient, can you describe symptoms of anaphylaxis? Can you tell me some symptoms that mean you need to use your epinephrine? Then ask them to demonstrate proper technique of the epinephrine device that they carry in clinic with a trainer. Um, when evaluating if they should carry their albuterol on their own, you can apply similar questions. This is a great chance for us to help increase children's healthcare literacy and to begin to prepare them for healthcare transition. A 2018 study found that te um, teens with asthma um, are usually in charge of their asthma medications. So over half of the uh, teens said that they were the only ones in charge of their asthma medications, controllers, or relievers. But despite this, um, just about only about half of them knew what each medication was for, and only about a third of them could name photos of their medications. So we need to continue to encourage parental involvement at home, especially for younger teens. But this is another great opportunity to help with healthcare literacy. The Allergy and Asthma Network's visual inhaler guide is very useful with working, when working with teens and young adults um, to review their um, asthma medications and which inhaler does what. You can also consider a visual asthma action plan. Visual asthma action plans have color photographs of each medication and device on the asthma action plan to help guide the patient to, to select the correct, the correct one. In addition to not always knowing what medication does what, risk-taking behavior becomes more common in adolescents and young adults. A study of 200 adolescents and young adults with food allergies divided them into a less risky and more risky group based on questions about their food allergy behaviors. And the odds of being in the more risky class were significantly decreased for students with, food, with peanut allergy, supportive female friends, overprotective mothers, teachers who are aware of their food allergy, a history of being bullied, or an established 504 plan. So we know that peanut gets all the attention in the media, 
but we don't want our young adult patients with other food allergies to think that there's not a potential for a bad outcome or a fatality. We need them to know that their milk allergy or their cashew allergy could produce a fatal anaphylaxis. Once again, we don't want them to live in fear, but we do want them to continue to be vigilant, encourage them to carry epinephrine. 13% um, of the children in this study did not carry epinephrine. And we want them to encourage them to continue to read ingredient labels. We can't give everyone support of female friends, but we can encourage patients and their overprotective mothers to help educate their peers. Their best friends and teammates should know how to use their epinephrine if the child has a severe reaction and be aware of their food allergies. And even though they're older and seem grown up, it's still important for teachers to be aware of their food allergies and parents should continue to communicate not only with teachers and school nurses, but cafeteria staff as well. Education is the best way to help um, mitigate risk-taking behaviors. Um, once again, I refer you to the SOAR peer-to-peer -peer food allergy videos. And um, this is another way to educate peers so that they have more, uh, so that the food allergic student has more support and may have less risky behaviors. Um, we should empower mothers to continue to communicate with the teachers and encourage education of students in their community. The final transition I'll discuss is when young adults leave for college or leave for independent living. This is a big shift for young adults. It's the first time most, most of them will take on full responsibilities for their allergies and asthma, but they're also going to need to learn how to navigate the healthcare system. When they do get to campus, many will find gaps in support for food allergy at college. At high school, there's still a good safety network, but at college, there can be gaps. Um, a study out, out of Northwestern interviewed many food allergy stakeholders. This included students with food allergies and their peers, teammates, um, resident life staff, disability advocates, as well as college administration, food service employees, um, first responders on campus, and risk managers. And when they interviewed this group of uh, stakeholders, they found some gaps in support at college. They found there is a need to clearly define the roles and responsibilities among fellow students, peers, roommates, and cafeteria staff. Who would help this child if they had a severe reaction and couldn't help themselves? Who will call 911? Who will administer epinephrine? The students are worried that their social network and friends would not respond appropriately in a food allergy related emergency and feel that their peers have a lack of awareness regarding food allergy related signs and symptoms uh, and the potential for fatality. So in, as a result of their study, this group developed a toolkit. It's called Spotlight on Campus Food Allergies Toolkit and it is available online. Despite being worried about gaps in support for their food allergy during college, they continue to take risks. Um, a 2009 online email survey of food allergic undergrads had 513 students respond. 57% um, of them said they had had an allergic reaction to the food that they were avoiding in the past. And 36% of them say they had anaphylaxis to the food they were avoiding in the past. But despite this, only 6.6% said they always carry epinephrine and only 60% said they always avoid the food allergen they're supposed to avoid. Of those that had a reaction during college, less than half of them, 47%, had any emergency medication at the time of a reaction, not even Benadryl, and only 21% had epinephrine at the time of a reaction. So we need to, this tells us that we need to continue at each visit to remind them of the importance of always carrying epinephrine and that, life, that early epinephrine is life-saving. And now I will transition my talk to a discussion of healthcare transition. Healthcare transition should not be a transfer of care. We don't wanna see an 18 year old and say, you're an adult now, this is the last time I can see you, go find a new allergist, that would be terrible. And nor should it be a, a drifting away from care. As young adults get busy with jobs and college and their social life, they might not make doctor's appointments and they might get lost to follow up. Um, which will be detrimental to their asthma and food allergy care. Transition is a years long process. Um, it should begin around age 12 and extend to their first few visits with an adult provider. All types of providers should address transition, primary care providers and specialists, pediatric and adult providers. The formal definition of healthcare transition is the process of moving from a child to an adult model of healthcare. 
with or without a transfer to a new clinician. Even if you see all ages, you still need to help guide patients through transition to an adult care model. And if you see only adults, you should continue the transition process for young adults you are welcoming to your practice. Patients at the age of transition are vulnerable. 19 to 25 year old patients are more likely to be uninsured and they are less likely to have visited a provider in the last year or have a regular provider compared to zero to 18 year old patients. There is evidence that lack of sufficient transition may lead to discontinuity of care, patient dissatisfaction, increased emergency department utilization and hospitalization, and lower self-reported health and well-being. The goals of good healthcare transition are to improve the ability of young adults to manage their health and to effectively use health services, and to develop an organized process to facilitate transfer and integration into an adult model of care. So in my slides, I've included tables and tools from supporting the healthcare transition from adolescence to adulthood in the medical home, and the, the references cited on the bottom of each slide. This 2018 update to the 2011 healthcare transition guidelines was supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, and the American, College, the American Academy of Family Practice, as well as the federally funded organization Got Transition. Here on table one, we see barriers reported by young adults and their families to transition. So they were asked about the transition process after they went through it and what went wrong or why they, were, why they didn't like it. And fear of a new healthcare system or hospital was a common theme. Patients like their pediatric providers. They're worried they won't like their adult provider. They have negative beliefs about healthcare. And they're worried about logistical issues like finding parking and making appointments, knowing who takes their insurance. They also reported inadequate planning. They felt that they had inadequate preparation and support from their doctors on the transition process to the adult model of care. Many of the young adults had never seen a doctor alone before. They also reported system difficulties, things like getting medical records transferred and finding a specialist who takes their insurance were problems as well. The good news is that youth with special health care needs like asthma and food allergy were found to be better at transition readiness skills than their peers without special health care needs. So the time that we spend teaching them about their health and how to take care of themselves does pay off. And transition's not just hard for patients, it's hard for providers too. Um, only 13 to 17 percent of providers meet the goals for healthcare transition. The three main goals of healthcare transition are the healthcare provider should provide alone time with the patient at preventative visits. The healthcare provider should work with the patient to gain self-care skills and um, to become aware of changes in healthcare at age 18. And the healthcare provider should discuss an eventual shift to an adult healthcare provider or model of care. The 13% that met the goals were caring for children without special health care needs, and 17% of providers who care for youth with special health care needs did meet the goal. When they asked providers what the problems and barriers to transition were, lack of communication was the number one. So there's not much communication or coordination between pediatric and adult healthcare systems. Training limitations were acknowledged as well. Many of us were not formally trained in healthcare or transition, so it's new to us. Clinicians were also worried about lack of coverage for young adults, lack of patient knowledge and engagement, poor adherence to care, and unrealistic youth expectations. There are six core elements of transition defined in the healthcare transition guidelines. They're outlined here in a timeline format. This is not a set model, but a suggested process that can be tailored to your own practice. It shows that healthcare transition usually starts around age 12 to 14, and it's sometime around the age of 18 to 21. It seems like it's very complicated, but in reality, it can be broken down into three steps planning, transfer, and integration. During planning, you should work with the family to plan for an adult model of care at age 18, plan on alone time with the clinician when appropriate, help the patient to learn um, to independently use health care on their own, and help them identify a vetted adult provider. So they like their pediatric providers. Don't just tell them to find a new allergist. Give them a specific doctor by name and tell them you know this is a good doctor. That means a lot to patients. 
Step two is transfer. This should occur with good communication, provide a medical summary to the patient and the new accepting adult provider. And step three is integration. When adult providers welcome young adults into their practice, and at that time, they can teach them about practice protocols, emphasize confidentiality in the adult health care model, and also let the patient be aware of their responsibilities as patients, cancellation policies, and prescription policies. This is another illustration of the six core elements of healthcare transition. The top row shows the six elements. The second row is how a pediatric practice can address these elements, and the bottom row is how an adult practice could address these elements. If you see both children and adults, you would need to do um, both the second and the third row. Step one is policy. Your practice should formalize a consistent healthcare transition policy and communicate that with patients. It's recommended that each provider in a practice transition at the same age for fairness and transparency. You want to begin to uh, notify patients and their parents of this policy around age 12 to 14. And at that time, also remind them of the upcoming legal changes to healthcare that occur at age 18. Step two is tracking and monitoring to facilitate data collection, to improve quality at individual and population levels. If you're doing quality improvement or research, you would need to um, record this in a database or an Excel spreadsheet. But in your practice, you might just document transition discussions in your progress notes. Step three is readiness assessment. You want to assess the patient's skills to manage their health. And as allergists, we do this all the time. We've been discussing this all along today. But there are formal healthcare transition readiness tools available, and I will give you a resource to locate them later. Step four is planning. During this stage, you should uh, prepare a portable medical summary and share it with the patient and their new medical team and help them choose a vetted healthcare provider. Step five is transfer of care. During this time, you should um, write a transfer letter and send the summary to the new team. And you should transfer patients when their chronic disease is stable. So when their asthma is not under good control, it's, you shouldn't be in a rush to transition them. Wait till their healthcare situation is stable. And for patients who have multiple doctors, it's recommended to stagger clinicians. So it's not a lot of stress with transitioning all their doctors at the same time. Adult providers at this point would help integrate the patients into their practice, reviewing their medical summary, welcoming to the practice, teaching them their responsibilities and the differences between the child and adult healthcare model. Step six is transfer completion and follow-up. So once again, if you're doing quality improvement or research, this should be documented and include feedback from the adult provider and the patients. But in your practice, you may just ask the adult provider to let you know that your patient was seen, so you know their asthma is getting taken care of. The next three slides are some examples of um, customizable tools that are available in this article as well as on the GOT Transition website, which I'll show you. These are um, customizable. You can put your practice name, your logo, and your letterhead on it. And these are stating the policy, and it's designed to inform patients and their families. So it's designed to give to families around age 12 to 14 um, template A is for practices transitioning youth to an adult health care um, model. So if you see only pediatric patients, this would be helpful for your practice. Template B is for practices transitioning youth to an adult model of care without changing clinicians. So in your allergy clinic, if you see children and adults, we still want to prepare them for the adult health care model. So this letter helps them prepare them for that. Um, and you can continue to discuss it at future visits, even though you're not transferring them to a different provider. And template C is for practices integrating new young adults into adult health care. So gottransition.org is a great website. You can learn more about transition. There are CME videos. There's further more detailed explanations of the six core elements. The formal healthcare transition readiness assessment tools that I mentioned um, can be accessed on this website as well. And there's also information on billing and coding for the time that you take to help, you, help youth transfer their healthcare. There's also really good resources for patients. There's a um, frequently asked question section that young adults might want to read as they transition to an adult model of care. And there's a quiz for them to take. Are you ready for healthcare transition? It's an empowering quiz. It gets them thinking about important issues that they'll need to address 
but I took it and purposely got a lot wrong. And even if you get them all wrong, it's still encouraging you. It doesn't say you'll never be ready. Um, I think that um, patients will find that useful. And the final part of my talk today will be on caring for older adults with allergic diseases. There are many changes that need to be addressed for older patients with allergic diseases, and this could truly be a webinar in itself. Today, I'm gonna to discuss a few important points. We know that many older adults suffer from polypharmacy. The American Geriatric Society reports that 90% of adults over age 65 in the United States fill at least one prescription per month, and 66% fill three or more prescriptions per month. Due to polypharmacy, comorbidities, and changes in anatomy and physiology, older adults are more susceptible to adverse drug reactions. They also have increased asthma and anaphylaxis mortality, and due to anatomic and physiologic changes in the nose, they have different causes of rhinitis. The American Geriatric Society BEERS criteria includes medications and medication classes that most older people should avoid. Um, this list is named after Dr. Mark Beers, who made the first list in 1991. It's updated regularly, and it was last updated in 2019. Potentially inappropriate medications for older adults that we may use in the allergy clinic include first-generation antihistamines and doxepin, as well as alpha-adrenergic agonists. First-generation antihistamines like brofeniramine and diphenhydramine cross the blood-brain barrier and can cause central nervous system adverse reactions, including drowsiness, fatigue, dizziness, impaired thinking and memory, agitation, and hallucinations. They also have anticholinergic side effects, including dry mouth and eyes, constipation, urinary retention, dizziness, and postural hypertension, which are risk factors for fall. Some first-generation antihistamines affect serotonin receptors and cardiac ion channels and can lead to dysrhythmias, QT prolongation, and postural hypotension. Despite this long list of possible adverse reactions, a lot of older patients still take first-generation antihistamines. A 1999 study showed 13.6% um, of Americans 65 and older filled at least one first-generation antihistamine prescription in, in the year studied. And that only accounts for those that were um, purchased by prescription. Many of these are available over the counter. So while you may not be prescribing first-generation antihistamines for your older patients, it's important for us to educate them that they shouldn't buy them over the counter. Some patients get a false sense of security with over-the-counter medicines and think they're all safe. So we should always remind them. Alpha agonists also have um, adverse reactions. Oral alpha agonists like pseudoephedrine are CNS stimulants and can cause anxiety, irritability, insomnia. They can also cause palpitations, urinary retention, and elevated blood pressure. They should certainly be avoided in patients with cardiovascular disease. And topical or intranasal alpha agonists can cause rebound vasodilatation and congestion, as you know, but due to anat anatomic changes in the nose, older patients are more susceptible to the, that side effect. Here is a list of drugs that are considered generally safe in older adults. Second generation antihistamines are preferred over first generation histamines for the reasons I discussed on the previous slide, but use caution with cetirizine and levocetirizine, which can cause sedation. Intranasal corticosteroids are generally safe, but use caution in adults who also have asthma if they're on higher doses of inhaled corticosteroids due to the risk for osteopenia and osteoporosis. Intranasal antihistamines, leukotriene modifiers, ipotropium nasal spray um, are all safe. And nasal saline products, lavage, spray, and gel are safe. And due to increased nasal dryness in older adults, they are helpful in many forms of rhinitis in older age. So rhinitis is common in the elderly. Um, structural changes in the connective tissue and vasculature of the nose contribute to rhinitis. Older patients have decreased total body water content and develop degenerative changes in their mucous secretory glands that result in decreased mucociliary clearance and lead to nasal congestion. Older patients have decreased nasal blood flow that leads to atrophy and drying of the mucous membranes as well as thickening of mucus. 
Some older patients developed increased nasal airway resistance due to loss of collagen and elastin fibers, as well as weakening of the nasal cartilage. And these are important to keep in mind when thinking of the differential. Allergic rhinitis certainly can occur in older patients, but it's less common in older adults than it is in younger and middle-aged adults. In patients 65 and older, the incidence of allergic rhinitis is about three in a thousand. Non-allergic rhinitis or idiopathic rhinitis is common in older patients, and the recommended treatment is an intranasal corticosteroid or intranasal antihistamine. Non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia often presents with perennial congestion and rhinorrhea and responds very well to intranasal steroids. Atrophic rhinitis um, presents with dry crusts and a nasal odor. This responds very well to lubrication with saline lavage. Gustatory rhinitis presents with rhinorrhea that occurs during meals or exposure to cold air, and it can be quite bothersome. It can be a large amount of rhinorrhea. These patients can avoid spicy foods, but treatment with hypertropium nasal spray is quite effective. And that has a low bioavailability, which is why it's safe in older adults. Drug-induced rhinitis is quite common in older patients because many of the medications they take for cardiovascular conditions or diabetes um, can contribute to drug-induced rhinitis. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, oral estrogen, aspirin, NSAIDs, and Viagra can all cause drug-induced rhinitis. The first treatment is to remove the offending drug, but many of these drugs are very important and can't be discontinued. In that case, intranasal steroids and or intranasal antihistamines are the recommended treatment. I mentioned earlier that older patients have increased asthma fatality, so we need to keep their asthma under good control, but we want to do so at the lowest dose of in inhaled corticosteroid possible. Um, adding a long-acting beta agonist, a leukotriene modifier, or using a biologic can help you control their asthma with a lower dose of inhaled corticosteroids, and an allergic asthma environmental control may also decrease the need for higher doses of inhaled corticosteroids. Older patients who are on inhaled corticosteroids should be canceled on lifestyle factors. Encourage weight-bearing exercise, which is quite important for bone density, and also encourage a healthy diet. Obviously, calcium and vitamin D intake are important, but so are adequate caloric intake and protein intake. Also, um, we should be discussing fall prevention in older adults who have risk factors for osteoporosis who are on inhaled glucocorticoids. Encourage them to wear good shoes with rubber soles. And if you're particularly worried about falls, a home health physical therapy evaluation can be quite helpful. In about 90 minutes, the physical therapist can come and watch a patient um, ambulate through their house, and they can identify fall risks that can be easily modified to help prevent a fall. Um, in postmenopausal women, and in men over 50 who have risk factors for osteoporosis, consider ordering a DEXA scan or working with their primary care provider to do so. There's an online tool called FRAX, F-R-A-X, and it's an online fracture risk calculation tool that can help you decide who uh, would benefit from a DEXA scan. So that's all I have, um, um, that's all I'm gonna talk about in management of older adults, but this will be a great segue to next month's webinar when Dr. Alan Baptist will discuss why is asthma so difficult to control in older patients. Um, so thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Maples. I'm gonna to apologize to everyone for the feedback. I'm gonna read the questions and then quickly mute because that's what takes care of the back the background noise. So, um, so Dr. Maples, our first question, they said that I was unaware that upright position is a risk factor. Can you give me the rationale for that or better yet, where to find the literature on that to share with, with families? So um, the literature came from um, the United Kingdom and they found that many people who had anaphylaxis fatalities in emergency departments, um, experience that right after a change to an upright posture and it's called empty ventricle syndrome so when during anaphylaxis when there's a lot of vasodilation the blood is going to go follow gravity because there's not good vascular tone anymore so if they stand upright more blood will go towards their feet if they're standing up lying down will help protect that so that they can perfuse their um, their heart and their brain and their important organs it's an older study it may be from the 1990s um, but we do include that on our food allergy action plan. Um, 
and as fellows, we read the article, but I don't remember. Um, it's so old, I can't give you the exact reference, but I could try to email it to you. Thank you. We have parents convinced that peanut allergies are airborne. How do we combat this and talk to them? So this is very hard because a lot of them read, you know, things on Google and they think that they what's on Google is true. A, a lot of parents, if you really sit down and tell them that it requires contact with the protein, not the the odor, and that we've proven that there's no protein in these papers. A lot of patients will believe us, um, but honestly, the the article from Matt, um, Drs. Abrams and Matt Greenhot is great, and it, it's easy for lay patients to understand. So, uh, it's a great summary of evidence. It's not just their opinion, and I would encourage. I've I've actually sent it to all of my colleagues because I think it's great for us to show families that believe that. I know some practices do proximity challenges if patients really won't um, won't believe you. Um, usually, if I talk to patients and show them evidence. They, they seem to believe me, um, but some people do proximity challenges where they open a jar of peanut butter and the, the patient stays in the room and they show them that they're safe and that they're okay. That's great. So what do you recommend within the school setting? How do you educate school staff to encourage children transitioning with their allergy responsibilities? So usually it's around middle school and uh, honestly, the schools that ask me to come talk and my partners are generally elementary schools. Middle schools don't ask us much. So we, we provide the middle school with their regular food allergy action plan and their asthma action plan. And then if we feel the child's ready, we provide self-carry forms. Um, and I do quiz the child. Um, like I mentioned, you know, tell me when you need your albuterol or what symptoms would you use epinephrine for? Um, but um, educating the middle school, school nurses and teachers, I haven't had a role in. Okay, thank you. So what is your opinion about on the on that whole topic of peanut free schools? There was a study you mentioned and the and the person who also wanted to know uh, what was the date of that study about not banning nuts in school? Um, it's on my slide. It's from it's from 2020, and it's in the Journal of Public Health Policy, I believe. But it's on my slide that says peanut-free tables or schools. The full reference is at the bottom. Okay, but can you help us with some strategies of how sure. to? Sure. So what we generally do is but school administrators. We recommend for younger children who might share, or certainly children who have developmental delay and you can't enforce no sharing, we do we do recommend if parents ask a peanut-free table or at least an allergen-aware no sharing table um, up to about third grade. After that, children are old enough to know not to share. Um, we know that if a little bit of peanut is on the table or they smell someone's peanut butter, they're not gonna have a reaction. So I don't recommend that people look for peanut-free daycares. Um, I've told parents that I worry at peanut-free daycares, they um, may have less preparation for anaphylaxis because they feel like they're immune to anaphylaxis since there's no peanut in the school, but there's still milk in the school. Um, so there could still be anaphylaxis. Um, I don't, for all the reasons that I outlined, I don't think peanut-free schools are necessary and we don't recommend them in our practice, but I do recommend a peanut-free table for children under uh, third, third grade and under. Okay, uh, here's a question. How can we change the language from overprotective mothers to protective parents in the research? Overprotective is a negative stigma. And what about fathers? Why are they written out of the conversation and the role of yeah. caretaker? Yeah. I did not design that study. That's the wording that was used in the study. I don't think that the moms are being overprotective. I would like to call them proactive mothers or proactive parents, um, but they, that's what was in the study. Um, but I agree. Um, we shouldn't call them overprotective. I think proactive is better, and both parents certainly have a role. Thank you. Uh, next question is, there's a conflict between professionals recommending that middle schools carry medications and state regulations in some states. Do you have recommendations on how to approach that conflict with parents, students, and state advocates? Um, writing to your state legislator can be effective. Um, you know, if you look at the number, I believe now 49 states allow children to have um, 
an unassigned epinephrine. And that work that happened from healthcare providers and parents writing to their state legislators. So that's a that's an issue that's a win-win for both parties. And I think that a lot of them are happy to help with that kind of thing. Um, in Virginia, if we provide a form that they can self-carry it, they can. So it hasn't been a problem that I've personally had addressed. I've trained and practiced only in Virginia. Um, but I encourage if you're a provider to, you know, give a call to your um your state legislators, and if you're a parent, do the same, um, because a lot of times they're very anxious to help with prop with um, that kind of problem. What happens? Thank, at, well, you. I I, thank you. That's great advice. So, so we've heard you say approximately what age uh, children should be carrying epinephrine. Is it appropriate for a younger child to carry their epinephrine if they seem to be very capable? Um. I, we've had parents say that they have capable four-year-olds, um, and I don't think that four-year-olds can understand when, you know, when exactly to use epinephrine, when not to, not to play with it. Um, so I rarely give it to children below middle school um, in a very ha select handful of circumstances. Um, you know, it's not written in stone. I have let certain children do it if, um, their, their school nurse is in a separate building than they are, and there's a worry that that would cause a delay in epinephrine, um, and the child seems ready, then I do. I think it has to be um, on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why I mentioned when we were showing that study that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Some kids may not be ready till they're older than 12 or middle school, um, but in certain circumstances, if there's a good reason, such as the school nurse is in another building, and that child seems to be able to demonstrate proper technique and talk to you about when to use it. And, and on a case-by-case -case basis, I have let younger children, probably nine might be the youngest. Okay, thanks so much for that. Do you find that transitions occur as patients become eligible for Medicaid? We're transitioning to a slightly older patient question there. Well, in, um, in Virginia, fortunately, all children are eligible for Medicaid, even if their parents' um, income exceeds the um, the maximum income that would qualify for Medicaid. So in Virginia, um, we don't really, I don't see that. Um, and I haven't looked at any data on that. Okay, next question is, how do we encourage physicians to use action plans for the schools? Well, we all, in, in Virginia, the schools require them. So we provide asthma action plan for every child with asthma and a food allergy action plan for every child with food allergy. And the school districts require it. Um, that's another thing where you're, you know, you probably have to talk to legislators and your board of education to make the, uh, make it a requirement that they have those action plans at school, because I do believe that they keep kids safe. That's a wonderful note to end on. Dr. Maples, thank you so much for being with us today. So at this point, please download the handouts from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the link in your email. Please join us next month for our August webinar when Dr. Alan Baptist will present on older adults with asthma, a different disease. This webinar will air on Tuesday, August 26th at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. You can also view our archive webinars on this page of our website. Visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We hope you have a great and a healthy day as we work to breathe better together.